were not planning to introduce us. They were just planning to call us onto the stage. <laughs> All right. Um, without much ado, I think we should start. So we are going to be doing a talk on future of education. We had sent out a note to all of you to ask for questions. We have received none. So we believe you all know everything about future of education. <laughs> we are hopefully here to just reiterate things that you already know. Um, but I hope to have a dialogue. I hope to have a discussion. Um, the idea of doing future of education came to me because in the last one and a half months, I've been uh, to a couple of very interesting, actually since April, I've been to a couple of interesting places. I, uh, we were invited to Ahmedabad University uh, to talk about our change maker missions. Uh, we were invited to a school, a uh, 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 middle income school in uh, Chennai. Uh, called Vedanta to talk about our change maker missions. Uh, we were, um, I was at Cambridge uh, the last week on 3rd of August and uh, we spoke about our change maker missions and um, there is a context to all of this why everybody is talking about it and uh, we thought it would be really pertinent to talk to our community about this, this too and why uh, we do a lot of the things that we do. So we're taking this opportunity on the Independence Day to meet you, to talk to you about all of this. Um, those of you who are coming in, don't sit on the side seats, the, the videographers block the view. So you sit a little towards the wing so we can see you too. All right. Let's go, Purva. So uh, as you said, ma'am, we didn't receive any questions. But when uh, I was thinking about future of education and when we keep constantly thinking about it, I, I had lots of questions. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you the questions that I have and that we have found from meeting with people and thinking about change making and the vision of the school. And as I was thinking, I think the first question is that in today's times, knowledge is so available and I mean, just everything is available. You know, you can just Google, you can just, in fact, not even Google, you can just ask chat GPT, not even for answers, but to do things for you. And very soon, I'm sure there are going to be apps and robots and there is, everything is uh, happening and there and possible. So if, before we go into future of education, I just want to ask that, is education even relevant now? Is it even needed? Okay, that's an interesting question. She starts off with an existential question, okay. Um, I think in order to understand the relevance of education or is it moot or not, we need to start with understanding uh, the fact that education has always served societies, okay. So whether it was in the ancient times, uh, uh, you know, education of scriptures or uh, teaching archery or uh, educating children on their local crafts, right, or uh, passing on a generation of artisans, you know, passing on their craft, any of that was always about context, was always about ensuring that um, it serves some purpose, okay? So in the industrial era, uh, it started off with wanting to create clerks because some, somebody needed people to push papers, right? The fortunate, unfortunate thing is that education has always had time to evolve and catch up with the age. We have evolved too quickly in the last, say, you know, a, 30 to 40 years, especially in the last two decades. And education has not had time to catch up. That's the first thing. The second thing I believe is that in the industrial era, when you're looking at um, how is it that uh, you take something this complicated and you know make it into smaller bits and feed it to the people who need to then go back and sustain the industrial era. In the process of creating that kind of an education system, we've created closed systems, you know, which insulate children from the rest of the world. There is a pre-prescribed textbook, a syllabus. They have to answer an exam to prove themselves proficient. And then that's it, right? So there is external things that are happening in the child's world come and sit in education systems at the periphery as extracurricular classes, as um, things that are hobbies, you know, as robotics, as STEM classes, as this, as that, but never touches or changes the core. That way we've created a black box in the education system and it's not, no longer responding to the outside world the way it would have otherwise responded because the world is changing at a larger pace. So if you ask me, is education moot? Education as we know it today probably is becoming more and more irrelevant. Um, but what it stands for, you know, the delivering of education and, sorry, knowledge and skills to children in itself is not moot. The question is what knowledge, how that knowledge is being delivered, what kind of skills, how is it being delivered? I think those are the questions that we need yeah. to ask. So when you're saying you're really saying, you're 
clearly saying education is not moot, but uh, the way it has been happening because there were certain needs, but they are not our needs now. So, uh, and also we are, we, are, we are evolving faster at a faster rate. And now that we're evolving at a faster rate, the next question that I'm thinking about is how do we know what the needs are going to be, say 10 years from now, say 15 years from now, when these children who are in school today are going to graduate. So say about 100 years from now, we could say that, okay, the way the world is now, it's fairly going to remain the same when our children enter the world. But it no longer looks like that, right? Like just six months back, chat GPT comes and just disrupts everything and people are now talking about careers and careers becoming irrelevant. So we may not know what the future needs are. So how do we prepare for those? Um, answering this in two parts. The first part is, if you look at what education always stood for, okay, there have been many, many philosoph philosophies of education. There has been a context of looking at it as from an existential perspective, essentialistic perspective, right? When you talk about essentialism, we already know everything that the child ever needs to know and we are delivering that, okay? That's one way to look at it. An existential perspective would be, you know, that the why are we here on earth, right? A humanistic perspective would be what does the child need? I think which perspective is being followed determines what what we are doing with education and what needs it caters to. The short answer to that question is we don't know what the skills will be. We will never know what the careers would look like, right? But there is a more nuanced answer to that and that is um, there is a part of human understanding and learning that doesn't change, which is the learning about self the learning about working with somebody else, and the learning about how am I responding to the world around me. And all of this put together is a combination of flexibility, adaptability, and empathy, which is definitely needed. And the knowledge that the child acquires in the learning system should serve the child in a way that it responds to the outside world, right? So it should layer through the context of the flexibility, adaptability, and empathy, so that the child can do this irrespective. And that can serve through different kinds of knowledge systems, it can serve through different kinds of skill systems, it can serve through different kinds of challenges outside of the space. Um, and hence, there is, a, there is some essentials that you can definitely cater to, but the how and the what that getting catered to uh, will, determine, will be determined based on the context of the child. And in terms of, uh, so you're clearly saying there are some essential things that we need to deliver. And are you saying those essentials are sort of timeless? They, they remain? And the essentials from what you're saying, what I'm understanding is that there are essentials in terms of knowledge and in terms of skills, but also there are essentials in terms of uh, metacognition and essential in terms of uh, social and emotional skills. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, but I'm not saying that it remains, certain things are timeless, okay? I'm talking about um, needs of the era, right? Needs of the context. Um, so there is a time when fight or flight was important. Fear-based, survival-based learning was important. And there was a reactionary mode to existence. If I don't do this, I am not going to have food, right? If I don't react to this way, I don't listen to this this way, my head is going to be chopped off, right? So there is, there was a reactionary mode to existence, which is not true anymore. So our children are living in very unique times. There's a lot of abundance at this point, um, uh, but our limbic system has not adapted very well to existing in abundance, right? So there is also reaction to imaginary threats, right? So feedback is a threat. Not knowing something is a threat. Um, uh, losing face in front of somebody is a threat, right? Um, we are not yet able to adapt and process the uh, complexity of newer situations, the dynamicity of a new situation. So. Uh, while the need for flexibility and adapt adaptability probably existed, it has just become more and more prominent in today's world. Um, at some point, you learn some trade, you learn some things, you pass through life. May have been enough. Some people were sons, some people had empathy, some people did something. Um, it, those qualities are timeless, but the need for those qualities uh, to coexist in the education system as a must-have in some way so that the child is ready for that complexity uh, that they will deal with outside is becoming more and more um, evident. 
And how, so you're saying that flexibility is needed, ambiguity, dealing with ambiguity is needed, and it's becoming increasingly uh, more complex, the world, right? So, I mean, I've heard a lot of, I've heard extreme views about uh, what should we do with the children when there's so much complexity, you know? There's one view, which is that, hey, you know, they're children and let them be children and do, we, we shouldn't really bring the complexity of the world into their lives yet. Anyway, they have to face it one day. So let's protect them, let's insulate them and let's create this environment where everything is uh, seemingly happy and safe and they're protected from it. But there is also another extreme view, no, which says that, Hey, you know, if they are, if they, if they're getting, why, why empathy? It doesn't work because it doesn't work in the world. The world is harsh, and then the child has to go out in the world, and they have to deal with the complexity. So let them deal with the harshness. Let them deal with the world as it is. And which one would you say works? <laughs> so um, the polarization of views, right? The either or is the view that I'm saying is going away and has to go away. So there is no such thing as let's protect the child completely or let's unleash the child onto the world completely. It's not either or. Um, it is again very contextual to where the child is. Today our children are living in and access to a lot of information and access to a lot of things that we typically at our age would not have access to. So either through newspaper or through the media that they have access to or through a friend that they have access to, many a times they know things way beyond their age. If you ask me should we be talking about sex ed uh, to children who are in first grade maybe yes maybe no but if they're already getting to know about it from somebody else and they're using uh, words and you know trying to grapple with constructs which are uh, beyond them by themselves the right thing to do from an education perspective is to take it to them and in a way that they have a trusted space to work with to talk about to listen to and um, address the conundrums that they're facing in some way. So when the world becomes, so let me explain what I mean by complexity, I think a little bit more, right? So um, just giving you a spectrum, right? So if you talk about something being simple, it's straightforward. Um, I don't know, maybe I was gonna say color, but even color is not simple. But let's assume that you see color and you're like, you know what, this is brown, right? Or some shade of brown, right? And then there is a uh, factory ecosystem which produces this color. Right? There is a set of steps that you need to do to produce this color. Then there is an ecosystem that is actually complex enough to interpret that color from a, uh, oh, this is for a marginalized population or this particular color is not really um, catering to this particular, uh, you know, way of interpreting it makes it seem like a stereotype, right? So the moment you start looking at it uh, from a very complex perspective, it is no longer a linear process that can be used to solve the problem. Yeah. The color now means, um, stereotype, it now means inferiority, it now means earth, it now means, um, I don't know, barren land, it now means so many different things. Yes, and suddenly. depends where you encounter this brown color with and in what, what context you're using the word brown or the yes. color brown. Right. Yes. So when the child is encountering this kind of complexity, they don't, they're not equipped to deal with it. And the only way they can be equipped to deal with it is if um, as schooling systems, as educational ecosystem, we stop just dealing with the simplistic uh, and just the complicated linear problems and bring in systemic problems into their environment. So lowering the barriers, lowering the walls and bringing in the world of conundrums that they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis into their lives. What does that mean? So, <laughs> Correct, actually I want to say, because that is, I mean, she's actually saying something very shocking, <laughs> by the way. Because not only, you're not saying that let's, one, you're not saying that let's prepare children ki as and when the complexity comes, they can deal with it. There is no right? way to do that. You're actually saying let's bring, like not even saying let's be prepared for the complexity, but let's actually bring and welcome that complexity in, not even simulate it, but bring the actual world's real big uh, problems and the nuances and the complexity into the world. So. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that's but what not by opening the gate and letting everything. Right. Out. By designing for that complexity to exist right. in the child's environment, this complexity which already exists in their environment. Right. The conundrum between should I uh, choose a donut versus <laughs> a carrot. The conundrum yeah. between you know yeah. I really I really really like watching uh, this video game or uh, you know spending time on mobile, but you know I also want to go out and play. Uh, but this is dragging me in now. I don't no longer remember how much fun I used to have. 
have. Um, I would like to write a story, but I hate writing, right? That conundrum between having to choose one versus the other cannot be dealt with. The child who sees beggars on the street and is unable to resolve their own privilege and not understanding what to do with it. So do I solve it by saying, oh, I should give money? I should not give money? What should I do? Uh, one of our children who saw a stray dog uh, roadkill on the street came to school crying and what should you as a parent or an adult do in this ecosystem can you just tell her it's okay beta don't cry this happens nobody has a solution to it do any of you know if you see a roadkill whom to call what to do we don't these complex realities of their current life, I cannot simulate, you cannot simulate, but we can live it with them through frameworks, through discussions, through systems thinking, and that's the only way to help the child learn how to cope with it. Not from a, if I were an adult, um, I don't know, MLA, governor of this place, how would I solve it? No, as a child, as a citizen of this city, as a citizen of this Kanuru village, as somebody who comes to this school, how will I solve this problem? Thinking like that is the only way to help them see that there is a lot of interconnectedness. Why do road kids don't get, uh, uh, don't get addressed? Why after knowing that sugar and sugar addiction is bad for children and everybody overall and rising cases of diabetes, nobody bans those products, right? Why after knowing that, by the way, August 2nd was an earth overshot day. I don't know how many of you know about this. So far, so far this year, we've already consumed all the resources on the face of earth that could be replenished in this year. August 2nd. That means the next four months, that we are living, we should be living in, I don't know, dread, <laughs> nothing, backward, returning to the environment. I don't know how to even begin to solve it. But the Earth Overshot Day happened this year on August 2nd. And it applies to India too. It's not like it doesn't apply to India. So there is no future that you can really prepare your child for. You can prepare them to start dealing with complexity on a day-to-day -day basis where they are today with whatever they uh, have. And build sufficient inspiration and motivation, intrinsic motivation to want to deal with that complexity, not get frustrated by it. Um, if there is frustration, convert that into how do I find a way? How do I find a way forward? I'm frustrated because I care about it and I want to find a way forward. Yeah, and and ma'am, you were saying uh, that it needs a systems kind of approach, right? So I just wanted you to give some examples of that. Like how do we, what do you mean by when you say a systems kind of approach? Like why can't this be, uh, say a project that, hey, let's see the roads, let's say like a common social science project, right? That let's say the roads are um, not, or the street lamp is not working. And now let's write a letter uh, to the municipality to get this. Why can't it be an, a, a small project or like an uh, extracurricular thing they do or some kind of, uh, thing like that. When you're saying systems, it, I'm, I feel like you're not meaning this. So what do you mean by systems and how is that different from this? And how does that work? Right. So if you had to name this, you would call this a problem-based approach. So it is not that there is a textbook or there is a syllabus and we have pre-prescribed sections in it. You know, these are the different kinds of garbage and here is what you should do with it. Or these are the different kinds of sugars. Here is what you do with it. And uh, whether you like it or not, you accept my conclusion that what this is unhealthy, this is healthy. And this is how you should eat. This is a balanced meal and that's it, right? But when we are approaching it from a problem-based approach, one, the problem comes from children's lived reality. So children saw somebody bringing so-called junk food in the boxes, right? And they questioned it. And then they said, why little bit? Little bit is okay. You know, why can't we eat little bit, right? So that conversation led to the further questioning which came from them. And in that kind of an approach, there is space, even if fact stares you in the face saying, you know, uh, certain kinds of sugars are not good for you, certain kind of junk food is not good for you. Even when fact stares at you in the face, they are like, no, no, we like it, we're going to eat it. No, not our waste. We are not going to take, do anything about it. For, and for weeks together, yeah, they they're going to shame, right? Yes, yes. For weeks together, they're grappling with the disagreement. And the disagreement is not trivial. There is shame because if I acknowledge it's my waste, if I acknowledge I'm addicted, I have to work on it, right? And I don't know how. 
and when you're working on a project that's pre-assigned, even if it was brought by the child, there is a closure to it. None of these problems have a closure. A problem-based learning is going to get handed over generations to generations. In fact, when we are putting up these stalls today, the change maker missions work that we do when we are putting up these stalls today, we ask children, why are we putting up these stalls for the Independence Day? We could put it up on any other day. Why Independence Day? And they saw, we actually helped them see this grid that, you know, the true ESM plates, NCV and CSP missions that they're working on are timeless missions. At every era, there have been different kinds of challenges um, that these missions have posed humanity and living things. As long as there are living things and humanity or any kind of advanced evolutionary culture, right? There are going to be these problems and these problems are not gonna go away. They are in some ways called wicked problems. You approach, open up something, solve something, you see some more layer. You open up, approach something, you see one more layer. Say for example, something like plastic, right? Let's take plastic as an example. Um, it was uh, to solve a certain problem. It is a beautiful solution, um, helped us through the industrial era. We are where we are thanks to a lot of the plastic uh, that has existed around us, but has created an immense problem for us. And today we are grappling with that problem, but can we ignore all the benefits that plastic has given our society and go to solve this problem without understanding it? Because if we just do, you know, Morcha saying, you know, let's go plastic, know, ban right. plastic, it's not going to work. Right. It's only going to aggravate the problem. So you have to understand the nuances of the system, which no single person in a textbook, no single teacher, no single source can actually provide to you. Yeah. And the main difference between looking at it from a project versus a problem is that you own that problem, you work on that problem, you invest yeah. in that problem without being invested in one way to solve it. Yeah, correct. This is actually, I connected it to what you were talking about. It's not an either or kind of approach. We can't have an either or approach. And I, uh, I was uh, reminded of the imagery work that we did with children. So in the beginning of the year, when the children had just come in for the orientation week, and we had just introduced the theme being change makers, and we ask them that, okay, but why? <laughs> why should we be change makers? And not only are we saying, so we are not saying that some people somewhere can be change makers, but we're saying every child a change maker. So, but, but why? Why? Uh, and we did, we started off by doing some imagery, which is that we gave them different eras. So we started with the hunter gatherer era and we asked them just imagery works like this. We give them the prompt and they just represent whatever they think or know about it. They just represent it through a quick movement and then we may unfreeze them and talk to them. So we went from the hunter gatherer era, the farming era, then we came to city states and as they kept doing the imagery, we asked them to represent present, okay, what might your problems be? So when they're being the hunter-gatherer and they're doing, they're saying things like, you know, where to find food, how to trust the food. And we saw that from survival, the problems went to little more interpersonal, little more dependency, stereotypes grab came in. Grab for land and power. G correct. Power came in at some point. Um, then there is a lot of free time. At some point after technology came, there was free time. And by the time we crossed technology and we reached the current contemporary era, we had children representing things like robots making robots and then data getting leaked and then uh, you know whatever they have searched on the search engine is now leaked there were people who were being researchers and scientists and somebody was genetically modifying well, humans well purva ma'am uh, what did you sell identity, I, identity insurance. insurance she sold identity insurance and all of them bought it Okay, and they so, didn't ask me anything, which company, what are you going to take Basically what happened is in different, different, uh, so there were about six groups doing the contemporary era and they were showcasing problems and she said, you know what, they have a, they have a, uh, they're doing hacking and they're basically selling the data somewhere and then I got bought all that data and I'm going to leak all your search history from GPT to everywhere. Who wants protection, <laughs> insurance, identity threat and they all bought it. And then she's like, you didn't ask me what, why, nothing, you know, you just bought it. So from there, we had actually arrived. And I think with the children, you know, with Grisha, we had called it. It is a web of problems. It's not like there is one simple problem that we can address with a simplistic 
uh, solution or a one-way solution. Like then we had a discussion about the climate change and how food chain might be linked to climate change. So it can't be a simple solution like that and it can't be a one-time solution also because whatever we do might create some new thing and then that will have some effect and that effect will again not be like a linear. It won't be like just a domino but it will have ripples and we'll have to kind of see and then there were ethical concerns also that came in, uh, uh, you know, so I just wanted to uh, bring this up and talk about, so we have this web of problems, which is why we can't uh, all the more talk about an either or, or talk about, uh, okay, this is the problem, let's solve it like that, or let's, uh, yeah, like in a, in a very simple, fast way and feel a sense of, okay, we have done something. So it's within the ambit of this complexity sits the interdisciplinarity, that is many, many kinds of people yeah. Uh, many, many kinds of skills, many, yeah. many kinds of knowledge that comes together to solve this problem. So there's this very interesting example of, um, you know, COVID and, uh, you know, when you assume a team of people being put together to solve or think about COVID yeah. as, a, as a problem, who would you assume to be on that team? To solve the COVID problem, mm -hmm. um, uh, medical personnel, uh, for, so there might be medical researchers because they have to create the vaccine. There might be medical um, administrators, maybe um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, that's what I can That's it. Psychologists? No. Behaviorists? Uh, right. No. Historians? Anybody think of historians? Do you know who came up with that? So nobody was, we have not faced with this yeah, problem, yeah, right? Yeah, of, uh, yeah. you know, virus spreading, yeah. how much distance, how can people go out? How can people step out of their houses safely? Nobody knows. And do you know who solved that problem? A historian. He wow. had access to an archive. He knew where to go get this information about Spanish flu, where people had figured out what kind of a distance would be optimal for the virus to actually travel and figure things out. And he was critical in determining that um, six feet distancing that we were maintaining. Wow. Yeah. So you wouldn't assume that these kind of problems and who would be able to solve them and who is sitting on that inter interdisciplinary teams. Yeah. So even more increasingly, children being able to learn as wide as possible yeah. and multiple kinds of depths for them and being able to see themselves as part of a system, yeah. right, yeah. is very important. Uh, when you were saying this, that children interdisciplinary and children being able to learn multiple things and not multiple things in the sense of jack of all trades, that kind of thing, but multiple things. So there is width, but in each thing there is also depth. But, you know, there is this whole debate and discussion about niche that we should help children, probably there'll be, and it'll get more and more niched and very niche careers will be in demand. So shouldn't we prepare our children to really narrow it down to that thing that they are really, really good at and really passionate about and help them develop that niche also so that they be, they're, they're more irreplaceable. <laughs> Um, so, how, how, so human beings from an evolutionary, living things in general from an evolutionary as well as biological perspective, human beings specifically, right, human babies are very versatile, born with multiple kinds of intelligences, able to do a lot of things uh, if they choose to put their mind to and using one thing which nobody has yet found out where it lies in our entire um, biology or our physiology, which is motivation inspiration, right? So how do you inspire a child to want to pick a niche or to want to walk a certain path, right? Nobody has cracked the science of it yet. When we do, we will make sure that we keep you posted. But since it has not been cracked, the best solution for it is to ensure you give children sufficient exposure to the real life, to the real complex problems that they're dealing with and ensure they have the necessary tools, they have the necessary access, they have the necessary mentorship and um, sufficient amount of challenge to deal with it. Okay, so I mean as we are talking about all of this, we have so far said that it's complex, we need to uh, bring the complexity in. There in is a, one more yes, problem, yes, right? So yes. if we were to ask or start tuning a child in a certain direction, saying, oh, you pick this niche or that niche, there is an ethical problem at play, right? Who decides that, right? And I think even as uh, our genetic engineering and everything is evolving, that question is still 
um, going to be a mo like a debate point that can you decide for a child and when is a child ready to decide on something. So the best hope in many ways that we have with the complexity out there and what the education can really serve is to provide children the most nurturing, the most um, open, available ecosystem that can provide the kind of depth both at home and at school so that children have that kind of access when they go out, it doesn't feel alien completely. Yeah, I was going to ask something else, but when I heard you and you're talking about ecosystems, I just, I'm thinking about what is the role of the community then? Because if it's an ecosystem, it is not like uh, a child with a textbook and a teacher. Uh, you know, it's not like that. So what is the role of a community and why does that become, I mean, why does that become important? Right. I think there are three layers to community. One is definitely at children's level, there is a community that is, uh, it's not just me and everybody else is a number or everybody, except me and my friend and that's it, right? Them being able to see themselves as a coherent whole, um, which in itself is a challenge, right? Because I disagree, I don't like, I judge another person. But these are the people who are your future cohorts, who are future peers, who are going to be working with you as you grow up, right? And you would hope to have like-minded people as you grow up into your spaces. The second thing is the facilitators or the mentors, whoever is working with these children, them experiencing a sense of community together because in that sense of community there is safety, there is growth, um, there is a built sense of belonging which then enables you to do what is necessary to build that complex ecosystem because no single person knows what the child really can do or needs or uh, what needs to be, how to address a problem that is in front of the child, right? So it needs discussions, it needs debates, it needs collaboration, um, but it needs to happen in that ecosystem of the safe space of what the community provides, right? Then parents, which is a very, very important thing for us, which is um, as we're looking at the future, right, when children are dealing with complexity and we as parents have not dealt with that complexity as children, we may be dealing with it at our workplace today, but we have not dealt with it as children. Trust me, nobody here currently has sufficient empathy on their own to provide their child because we don't know completely what the child is going through, right? But together, there is a possibility that we could see the challenges, the opportunities, right? What the child um, could be. So, ma'am, we are at 3.40 or 3.45. Huh? We should open it to uh, questions? Yes, we can. Hello. I have questions. <laughs> you people didn't send questions. You people didn't send questions. So I'm going to... Okay, right? <laughs> they didn't know what we are going to talk about. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wrote these questions uh, now. I think these are some of the questions that I've been observing coming through the child journal too. I mean, not really the uh, the uh, appearing layer, but the deeper layer. Um, the first role of community you spoke. I think there is a definition of success that as a community we need to hold, which enables us to understand where are we being successful in with respect to the child, with respect to us uh, as parents, with respect to us as parents, I mean, uh, as educators and as a community, like all those layers. Like what would be a good um, definition? I can ask the rest of the questions after you address if that is okay, or I can share the questions. Um, can we hear all the questions? I can definitely, yeah. Um, role of sex education. I think it is um, very, important to address that because things are not the same as it was maybe a decade or a couple of decades back. Um, it's no more that cute crush related conversation that we are talking about. We are, we are talking about something more deeper that children are exploring which we can very easily think it is innocent which is not biological or maybe just physical exploration but it is more than that because the kind of content that they are exposed to and the kind of uh, environmental influence that they are uh, they are um, uh, interfacing with influences that particular angle. I think it is uh, connected to community too, because we have a certain uh, way in which we address these things. So that's my second question. Um, I think the absoluteness of things that you have addressed it. Um, there would still be question on um, with respect to academics. Um, isn't it important for a child to 
know certain things if it is it like if you go into two extremes of the child doesn't know or the child knows it completely is there is there something gray in between what does that even mean for the child that um what's a parent's role in these times okay parents roles are shifting as the reels switch you understand <laughs> like every day we see something new motivating one and then you're like yeah man yeah. you go and find your passion that is one day's this thing you don't know multiplication table that's the next day's this thing you can't even keep your notes properly that's the third day's thing you understand it's it's just changing reels every single day right is there something more um i'm not asking for a constant but is there something more um tangible we can we can all agree on so that we can stick to this is similar to the uh, definition of success that i was talking about um a uh, one i think slightly existential how do we know that uh, the problem that we are trying to solve here is sufficiently long sighted far sighted um long term and relevant uh, maybe 10 15 20 years from now too i mean there is a gamble there but which which exists in all eras like even when i was going to school my dad was taking some gamble that okay maybe this guy will learn something right uh, that always exists but um, because the more we believe we are um, sophisticated the more we want to be in control so ca- that question is coming from that control freakness of us as as humans R- right now that's all i will thank ask. you this will need a full one more session Uh, but i will try uh, can you the last one was can you read the question again thank you happy sir yeah so uh, the first one is the definition of sex the, the last back. question is how do we know that the problem that we are trying to solve is sufficiently far sighted yeah. and relevant yeah okay the one before that is that what is the parents role of the parent role? okay so how do i think this is going to be a very key takeaway so how do i know as a parent right that i am doing the right thing or i am doing what is enough or i am doing what will help you help us and you collaborate and work towards whatever vision we are working towards for the child um and this has been a theme of this year too for us okay and it has been always something that i've seen that children don't know how to stay with the discomfort of a problem of not knowing something not being able to do something not being able to be seen as awesome at something without putting any effort okay i'll repeat it again they don't know how to stay with the discomfort of not knowing something not being able to do something or not being heralded as a hero or an awesome person when they have not put any effort okay so your job and our job is to help them and remind them that stay with the discomfort stay with the discomfort you don't know something today if you stay with the discomfort and tell yourself you can figure this out you can figure this out most people 99.9% of people run away when something gets uncomfortable and they choose comfort over learning and i told you earlier in the talk that not knowing something when we were hunter gatherers was life threatening was causing extreme fear so we have over the many 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 millennia learned to run away sometimes physically most of the time emotionally right now mostly mostly because you can't run away physically right so we switch off we make excuses we tell ourselves i don't have a science brain i don't have a math brain uh, th- i am not cut out for this i'm not a music person i'm not a dance person i'm not this i'm not that or this is this doesn't work this, this doesn't work this is too much why am i being asked to do this why should i do exams all of these questions are their reactions many a times to not being willing to stay with the discomfort so somebody was asking me that day oh my child multiplication table this that right i told them one thing right if you help the child stay with a problem and stay with that discomfort not i don't know this what do i do i can't do this then hurry then a very very fast paced hurry right can you help them 
stay with the discomfort. For that, you have to be aware, what do you do with your discomforts? When you get uncomfortable, do you get jittery? Do you start controlling? Uh, do you start giving away answers? Do you start shouting? Uh, do you give up? Do you label the child saying, oh, it's so much, it's so sister better, it's so sister better. Hai. Like, this child can only do this much, the other child is better, I'm okay. Right? Are you willing to detach your parent identity with your child's progress? and with your child's actions, with your child's behaviors, right? That is a discomfort, being so attached to my child's success, right? Once you start doing that, you have enough distance to actually start seeing, oh, all my child is feeling is some discomfort. And by the way, at the heart of every discomfort, at the heart of every discomfort is fear. Fear of not being sufficient, fear of not looking good, fear of being left out, fear of not belonging, fear of not being good enough. Fear. And at the surface of most of this is perfectionism. Right? I have to do perfect day one, immediately, right? So answering the first question that Happy Sir was saying in some ways, I've answered the fourth one, is that if we are able to stay away from perfectionism for our children and help them steer them towards thinking about problems and learning to stay with the discomfort despite failures, take feedback, there is some amount of success that we can actually pat ourselves on, right? And if you have not yet started seeing it in your child, that is a discomfort you will experience. It's not already there, right? Stay with that discomfort, okay? It's not there. Why isn't there? Where is the fear coming from? What in the ecosystem or the environment could be driving the fear, right? And that is what will lead to helping them stay with the discomfort, which will then enable them to overcome their need to look perfect, which if they are able to learn to let go, flexibility, adaptability, systems thinking, any of those 21st century skills can be made to sit on the learner, the learner persona. Right? So for us, if the child is able to acquire a learner persona and a mindset of a change maker, that is, there are big problems out there, they are complex ecosystem, wicked problems, and I am somebody who can contribute to solving them. Everything that I develop, my skills, my knowledge, um, my accolades, right, should contribute to surviving and uh, putting effort into building a better ecosystem for everybody else, then we can declare some amount of success in some ways, is what I feel. I think I've answered some of them. What's the other one? So there was a role of sex ed, and then there was one about academics and certain kind of knowledge. Yeah, sex ed, I will do another session completely on that, and he's right, there's a lot to talk about. Academics, I will never tell you academics is not important. Without the knowledge, the interdisciplinarity will not work. Skills sit on knowledge. Basically, it's a, it's a tango, right? I wonder, uh, I create wonder, I inspire children. They engage with that content, they develop some knowledge and skills, which again layers more skills, and it goes from there towards building connections into the problems they are working with, and then mastery, 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 mastery. But this mastery that they are developing is only a very small portion of everything widely that they're getting inspired with and inspired by. So they're also learning how to learn, how to master themselves. So you will see, you know, the choir that is going to perform, the singers who are singing here, right? All of these people actually role model learning by themselves, learning something by themselves and not just being taught in a certain way, note by note to be able to perform this. A lot of the choreography that you're going to see with children doing the history and perspective that you're going to watch is all done by children through us having taught them imagery. Okay, and there is a layer of um, mastery that we help them tighten and build, but there is a lot of ownership that comes out of an inspired child who wants to learn, who wants to figure this out. Let's not put the cart before the horse. The horse is the inspiration. It is the motivation. As long as that is there and the thirst to learn exists, we can hope to create change makers in this world, which the world badly needs today. Yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking when you were saying that the mastery is not for the sake of mastery, right? Like, for instance, learn the tables to learn the tables. It's a kind of mastery for mastery. Or for exam. Or, or for an exam, a like you're saying, the closed system, which is just serving itself. But the mastery is so basically, say, with the drama children. If they are very sure and the purpose is set that we really want to communicate to the audience, 
then obviously you need mastery to be able to do that you need your voice to work you need to know first of all you need you need to start with the knowledge of the script so on that then when the mastery sits it's um it's it it's more purposeful and you don't need fear to drive it and children uh, own it with you something i yes so one of the things that uh, minesh was asking me earlier is what i started with but i will end with that how do i know or how do we know that the way we are trying to solve this problem or the problem that we are trying to solve uh, is at least uh, some amount of long vision on it is that um, there is sufficient evidence coming from all the workplaces as well as the way international forums on education are moving the way universities in this world across the world are moving so i've been having a lot of conversation with people across the world on universities in india in lot of liberal arts education uh, and otherwise in professional education too they are saying yes this child has scored 99.9% but what else show me something more right i want a more um, wide ranged child i want somebody who is passionate who wants to make a difference in this world i was speaking to somebody who actually trains people to become music production uh, people plugs children into that space it's an education uh, uh, university and uh, I, you know we said we are a small school which does this kind of work he said that's the kind of children i want to talk to right you are on the right track on working with children on inspiring them on helping them see what is it that they want to see as they grow up right and um, when it comes to oh i will go out in the world will i be equipped to deal with competition the question is actually about what is this competition about and what is this path that i'm choosing right so if one of our children for example wants to work on a very specific path of a combination of neuroscience in that specifically effective emotion as a research pathway somebody wants to work on sustainable transport design as a specific career pathway right the kind of competition you are talking about is when you're talking about certain kinds of similar jobs mundane jobs with no vision that the child has the child is stepping into the world right but when the child has a vision there are problems out there there are tools out there there is space and you know uh, nurturing ecosystems out there which are wanting uh, such children to come and solve these kind of problems and i am connected to lot of networks of change maker children and schools which are actually solving problems like this and um, it looks like we are probably at the forefront of solving and showcasing this kind of a uh, uh, learning pedagogy rather than uh, being the you know people who are following through on a trend that was already established um but from, from an ecosystem perspective you ask about universities workplaces other school networks were doing something similar we seem to be on the right track so that's my way of verifying right that are we um you know jumping the gun somewhere or are we grounding ourselves well enough all right um we could we would love to take questions maybe now is a good time for you people to send out questions